All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar, Entering the Global Economy Through a Digital Marketplace. Uh, for, for purposes of time, uh, we are going to um, get started right now. Um, I wanna make sure that we are mindful of everyone's time. Um, Again, uh, welcome. My name is Cesar Vence. I'm the Deputy Director for the City of Atlanta Mayor's Office of International Affairs. Um, today, we are going to be talking about e-commerce and doing business in the digital marketplace. Uh, we're very excited about this. Um, have a great lineup of speakers for you all. So um, I hope that you all find this webinar and this discussion to be very helpful. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, We'll be taking questions through the chat feature on the women on the go to webinar platform. So if you have any questions, if you want to chat with us, just make sure that you use the chat feature on the platform box that should be displaying on your screen. Um, right after the seminar, you will receive a survey. Please take a couple of minutes to give us your feedback. This of course, always helps us as we move forward in designing new programming uh, and making sure that we are providing you with the necessary tools and resources to make you competitive. Um, lastly, we are recording this webinar um, and will be available in our website at a later date. So this conversation, again, as I mentioned, is part of our Global Trade Talks, which is um, an initiative that is, is a regional initiative. Um, and, and we, as the Mayor's Office of International Affairs, we run these efforts for the city of Atlanta. Um, so just before I kind of keep going, um, again, my name is Cesar Vence. I'm the Deputy Director for the City of Atlanta Mayor's Office of International Affairs. Uh, within the International Affairs Office, I lead the Economic Diplomacy and Global Sports Initiative. Um, within the Economic Diplomacy, we have you know, what we call our global commerce pillar, which includes the trade promotion initiative. We have four pillars under that initiative, which is our global trade talks, meeting our exporters, export mentorship, and trade missions. Um, again, we, we're here today uh, under our global trade talks umbrella. Um, if, you've, you know, if you've participated in some of these conversations in the past, you know that our goal and, and really the reason why we're doing this is because we want to make sure that our small and medium-sized businesses here in Atlanta have the tools and resources to expand their business internationally and to stay competitive in the global market. Um, today's webinar is in partnership with the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Uh, you know, we cannot do what we do without our partners which is, uh, before we go into, into more details, I just want to say that um, the, the one thing that makes Georgia and, and Atlanta very unique as it relates to the work that we do around trade promotion and international business is the collaborative approach that we take to everything that we do. Um, here are just a, a couple of the other organizations that are involved in trade and the work that, that, that we do as far as supporting our businesses. Uh, but as you can imagine, this ecosystem is a lot larger. Um, so I do encourage everyone to kind of really learn, you know, as you as to whether you are starting to export or you have been exporting for a while. Uh, I do encourage you to look into these organizations, get in touch with them, take advantage of what they have to offer because they're a great resource. Lastly, um, you know, why are we here today? Why are we having this conversation about e-commerce and digital? doing business in the digital marketplace. Um, I think, you know, obviously you see the numbers in front of you, but if you kind of sit back and think about um, your, your, yourself and what you're going through today, um, due to COVID-19 and sort of this new world that we live in, if you can imagine um, and just think about when was the last time you went to a store or when was the last time you went to the mall? Uh, and then also think about when was the last time that you placed an order online, whether it was food, uh, you know, cleaning supplies, your new phone. This is, this is the new world that we're living in. This is the new quote unquote normal. Um, so I just kind of put these numbers out here to put this conversation into perspective, but 
Um, you know, it is expected that we're going to have about 25,000 stores closing in the United States uh, in 2020. Um, there was a survey done by Morning Consult a couple of weeks ago where about 24% of the participants say they just didn't feel comfortable going to a mall within the next six months. Um, also, as far as the increased volume of transactions online, you can see 74% since March, since the time that the, the pandemic started. And then kind of, if you're looking at the, at the market and where the opportunities are, uh, you know, is it 18, is expected that the global e-commerce market uh, will be around almost $19 trillion by 2027. Um, so again, what we want to do here today is we want to equip you with the right information. We want to make sure that uh, if, you, if you haven't thought about doing business on the digital marketplace or, or, or e-commerce, that you know what this means and, and how to go about this. Um, and if you are doing business in a digital marketplace, uh, we want to give you additional tools. We want to put you in front of a of subject matter experts to actually help you grow your sales. Um, so just very quickly before, before I hand it over to, to my colleague, I uh, want to go over, you know, our, our agenda today. Uh, we have four great panelists uh, that are joining us today. Dr. Eva Doria from Georgia State University. Uh, who is going to talk about the rise of digital globalization. Uh, Nader Motosid, uh, who is the global product marketing manager from Amazon, is going to talk about how to accelerate your international sales using um, the Amazon platform. You will then hear from one of our own companies uh, in Atlanta local, uh, Baxter Baxter from Paincare Labs. Uh, she'll discuss her experience doing business online. And then lastly, uh, You'll hear from George Tracy, who is the director of the U.S. Assistance Expert Center here in Atlanta. Um, so with that being said, I want to hand it over to my good friend and colleague, Michael Tyson Johns, who is the director of global business development from the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Thank you very much, Cesar. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, as Cesar said, I'm the director for global business development at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Cesar and Vanessa and the whole team at the Mayor's Office of International Affairs for partnering with us on this great program. Um, I also want to thank the panelists uh, for taking the time to really speak about this very timely and important um, topic of e-commerce. And last but not least, I want to thank everyone on the call for joining us um, for your interest in that program, and I hope you find all of this helpful. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, our organization, um, the Metro Atlanta Chamber has been established in 1859, which makes us one of the oldest chambers uh, in the US. And we are known today for convening Metro Atlanta's most influential businesses and organizations, nonprofits, and universities. We work to grow the 29 county region through economic development. Uh, we advocate um, through public policy and we promote Atlanta in partnership with the Atlanta Sports Council, both domestically and abroad. While our priorities may have, sh may have shifted a little during this crisis, um, we are uh, um, we remain committed to um, lifting up Atlanta's building diversity, including um, a number of thriving industries, um, diversity of talent, colleges, universities, and companies that are committed to diversity in hiring. Part of our organization um, is an economic development division. Within the economic development division, we have a dedicated global commerce team, which is led by John Woodward, many of you on the call know. Um, and we both focus on both domestic international trade and foreign investment because we consider this as a two way street. We're always looking for new and innovative ways to help companies understand the benefit of international sales. Um, and we work really closely with our partners um, to really connect companies to those kind of opportunities. So today is one of these examples. I want to briefly talk about a program they've been operating for um, a couple of years, which is called the Atlanta Metro Export Challenge, which is one of the largest or probably the largest export grant program for small and medium sized businesses in the region. And this is really a joint um, effort between many of the partners here in the region, as has already showed on the slide, um, including the Georgia Department of Economic Development, um, the Mayor's Office of International Affairs, U.S. Commercial Service, uh, District Export Council, and many other private and public partners. And we all joined in this program to help companies financially to, um, to grow their international sales. 
And while that money is really often used for um, travel to go to trade shows um, or to, to conferences or meet with customers abroad, we always encourage companies to look at different ways of using that uh, the money. And so there are many alternative ways to really build your international sales while not being tra while not travel. So um, e-commerce is yet another opportunity for companies to really put that money to use. Um, another area we focus on um, is export certification. Um, we help companies that sell their products abroad with export certification, including certificates of origin or the sampling of invoices, a packing list. So if you ever need any assistance with that, please let us know. And um, last but not least, I want to briefly talk about a topic that really affects all of us here in, um, in the region. The Metro Atlanta Chamber uh, joined a coalition of more than 150 companies and organizations across our state to urge the state um, to pass a hate crimes law this session, um, which will resume next Monday. Georgia is one of only five states in the US uh, that doesn't have a hate crimes legislation. And there's a list of supporters for this legislation is growing every day. So if your company or your organization is interested in, in signing on, um, I would encourage you to please visit um, passhatecrimesga.com. Cesar will send out a link to that website um, in the follow-up email. And on the website, you can find, learn more about this issue and find actions you as an individual can take. And also can see a whole list, um, a complete list of all the companies that signed on to that. With that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Doria, who is the senior lecturer and co-director for the minor in international business at Georgia State University. Um, and I should also say probably a, a professional movie producer. Um, if you've seen some of the videos he produces for his classes, they are pretty impressive. And so I had the pleasure to talk to him for longer last week. And so it's, he always puts me in a good mood. So I'm excited <laughs> to hear him speak about the rise of digital globalization. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for the nice introduction. You are a nice man. You are a nice man. Nice to work with you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the uh, Mayor Office of International Affairs. A special thank you to Cesar. We are working together with Cesar in a very ambitious program called Meeting Our Exporters to help the students. And, and Cesar is leading that. Uh, thank you to the panelists that are today with me. It's, I am very, it's a nice day for me. It's a very nice day to talk about international business today and be with all these uh, prestigious panelists. And thank you for the audience. Uh, at the end of the day, I know that a lot of you are business leaders and, and in times of challenging times, right? challenging times, you are thinking about how to become better, how to become more global. So I have 10 minutes. I have my phone here. I have my phone here. And I will put the 10 minutes uh, uh, chronometer here, so I behave in the right way, right? And I, I have three charts to share with you and talk about the rise of uh, digital globalization. Let me go right now if I can share the screen now. Do you see my screen? Yes. Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me start with this first chart. Uh, I love I love technology. I love technology. Uh, I think every every business leader should should be curious, at least curious about about technology. Um, we uh, at the college where I have the good luck of working, we are very focused on being close to business, and 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 that means that we are in constant conversations with business leaders, and with business leaders of the traditional business, but also with this new generation of founders of new companies in, in different uh, technological sectors. For the, to be, to be, uh, to, to start in a simple way, I will say that when we talk about digital globalization, there is a core technology that we need to have and we need to pay a lot of attention and it's artificial intelligence. And I, I will say that the intersection of artificial intelligence and internet in the operating model of the companies is the fundamental fundamental ele element for the operating models to succeed in this new uh, digital globalization. I will talk about technology here. I will talk about business strategy, which is what I understand. But uh, 
but artificial intelligence, if you if you define it in a simple way and from a business strategy point of view, allows you to deliver more value to as many customers as possible at the lowest cost possible. And and here you have two two fundamental things. One is artificial intelligence allows us scalability, and and globalization is about scalability. It's about not focus only in one market is focused in the entire planet so artificial intelligence is helping companies to do that but the second thing is artificial intelligence is allowing us to do that at the lowest possible cost and one of the challenges that we we have and we will have even more is price erosion so two things uh lowest cost and scalability I, I don't have time to talk too much here. I'm, I'm following my my online timing, two minutes, 41 seconds. But I will recommend you, there are two colleagues from Harvard University that just published a book uh, called Competing in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And I will recommend uh, the audience to take a look to that book. It's, it's a very practical one, very, very practical one. Let me go right now a little more to uh, platforms right and and here here the traditional low risk low cost way of going global is through distributors and and don't misunderstand me i love distributors i i am a former executive i used to work with distributors all, all over the world i love distributors but but things are are changing and 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 if you if you plan the next five years or the next three years, uh, one of the things that is happening is, is, is rapid substitution. That means that copycat manufacturing, the capacity to copy your product is, is becoming easier and easier and easier and more distributed around the world. So, so the, the, first, the first challenge that we have in front of us is, is it's very easy for for distributors to change suppliers because you have this copycat manufacturing that produces products that are very similar to them. Uh, the second thing, which is very challenging, is uh, limited learning. And 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 what I want you to understand is the the, the, the competitive game of the future is about extraction analysis and control of that so that old model that i worked for i don't know more than two decades i don't want to say how many years that you don't have access to the data of the client or the final consumer uh it's a challenge i will say that to win in this coming digital globalization customer intimacy is becoming the key driver of success and that means extraction analysis and control of the data and when you start to think about going global well you need to have very smart strategic thinkers in your organization but also you need to have artificial intelligence to manage this massive amount of, of data the good news is that there is a new model there five minutes 26 seconds the new good news is there is a, a new model there that is called matchmaking or platform business model, which is a plug and play infrastructure for sellers and buyers to plug and interact with each other. Well, I love this model. I think this is the future. I think every business leader should think about how to become platform centric because it's not only about buying and selling it's about how to manage your people how to manage your innovation how you how to manage your presence in the web so and this new model grows very fast and it's an strategic call for every company in this model to go global very, very fast as a result of something that is called network effects, right? When you reach something like 25, 30% of penetration, 
it starts to grow so fast that under the right conditions, uh, if you are first, it's very difficult to, you know, to compete against you if you have a platform there. So the platform, what you see is they become global. What it took for companies 50 years before, now it takes for the new platform five years to be almost present in every single country around the world. So the second call is good news, artificial intelligence, internet, and a lot of other technologies are allowing us to move from the pipe business model to the platform business model. The platform business model, in essence, is global. So every single leader should think global. When you see the numbers, and, and to, to see the future is, 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 is difficult, right? Uh, it's expected that by 2025, platform will account for about 30% of the global economy, a lot of money. So I have three minutes more. These are my recommendations. Every business should evaluate how to compete on AI in order to foster efficiency, scalability, scope, and learning. My second recommendation, every business should evaluate to become more platform-centric to maximize flexibility in times of rapid disruption while being obsessive, and I, I tell you, I love Amazon, I love Amazon, and I don't want to say too high Alexa because I have Alexa everywhere here in my house. To being customer-centric, customer intimacy and product service excellence. The third thing that I want to say is carefully watch the smart cities. These are the platforms of the future. And I'm very proud of be here in Atlanta that is for sure, one of the next smart cities, top smart cities in the world. I think that's a place where every company should focus where their their platforms. Uh, I also want to say, and I don't want to go to, you know, we don't have time to talk about this, but I think it's coming a new age, which is an age of robotics, where where we will see robots with people managing the robots from other countries. I had a very good conversation with the CEO and founder of a crewless ship. So from an office in London, they they can they can manage a ship to cross the ocean. Another, I had a good conversation with the CEO and founder of Natilus, which is a huge uh, drone the size of a 747, uh, of course, driverless, right? And pilot less than, and from a from an office in California, they can cross the ocean. A reduction in freight cost by 50%. They are working on that. So yeah, smart cities, and for all that, you need a smart cities. Uh, I will say this is a very important opportunity. Consider to hire a digital platform strategy director. Maybe if you have money, a chief digital officer. But I think that is very important. It's a very very very, very important. Of course, participating platforms. I said I love Amazon. I think it's they are doing a great job. It's an inspiration for me, and it's an inspiration for our students. And and um, and the final thing that I will say is, look, there is a huge opportunity to build uh, platforms, global platforms, focused on micro trends. So uh, a global platform is 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 a lot of work create a platform because it's the chicken at the egg yeah you need to have the supplier and you need to have the consumers and you don't have the consumers because you don't have the suppliers and you don't have the suppliers because you don't have the consumers a lot of work uh, i think there is an opportunity for for retailers around the world for company for, for companies around the world to identify micro trends that will become important business in the future and create uh platforms and i will say i will say that of course you can make it bigger in the future. But I think it's, it's also a huge opportunity to what I call build to sell. That means uh, you, you build the platforms and, and you sell that to, to other companies in the future. Well, that's all. I think I am in my, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. 11 minutes, sorry, 11 minutes, 25 seconds. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Doria. Um, really, really insightful information um, just a couple of uh, just one follow-up question before we go into our next panelist um 
And you know, I read a, an article that you that you wrote a few years ago uh, where you talked about the importance of data. Uh, and I think you, you kind of alluded to AI. I'm just wondering if you can just very briefly talk about uh, from, from a data perspective, why is that so important right now for, for businesses and, you know, as they go into more of this digital world? Uh, well, thank you, Sensor. Not only for the question, not only for inviting me here, also you are my only one reader of my articles. I have only, <laughs> I have only one reader of my articles. So it's a bestseller, one reader. So uh, look, uh, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that the most important competitive advantage in the future is extraction, analysis, and control of data. And, and just to be, just to simplify, I will say, from my, my perspective, the huge competitive advantage is uh, prediction. Uh, and, and, and of course, it's also an advantage to be able to analyze patterns, right? To identify consumers and segment of consumers and, and even to make some, I was talking to, a, I was talking to a, the founder of a company in uh, Germany three days ago, they have a platform based on artificial intelligence to help retailers to select the best last mile distribution system. So this is the artificial data is helping you to an artificial intelligence to decide better, right? But in terms of prediction, I think we need to move so fast. We need to move so fast in this new age, so fast because the lifespan of companies is shorter because because consumers they don't have patience that that this predictive power when i say i don't want to say alexa to, to you know to her here but when i say <laughs> i use my dear. No, i don't want to say alexa because you say what do you need dr doria what do you need it's so nice it's so nice it's becoming better it's becoming emotional too it's so good so but but she she is telling me she's telling me look don't forget to buy this don't forget to buy this she's talking to me i said don't forget to buy this so i think prediction is is very powerful I think analyzing patterns and discover, well, look, this consumer maybe won't pay you. And so it's better not to sell. I think it's very good and prescriptive is very good. So yeah, that that's what and, and by the way, I'm very I'm very proud. I'm very proud that I work in a in an environment in and in a college that we have uh, uh, an institute of insight where we train our students to work with corporations, not only in the US, around the world. Uh, to analyze data and to and to help companies to solve real problems uh, based on the analysis of that, and we we use at the Institute of International Business, we try to leverage all that to embrace this new digital globalization. Thank you, Dr. Doria. I really appreciate it. And uh, we do have a couple of questions that are coming into the chat. Um, and um, what we'll do, just in the interest of time, um, I'll try to reply to some of those questions and. Uh, the questions that are addressed directly to the speakers, we'll get to them at the end of the panel. So with that said, um, I'd like to now um, go ahead and introduce our next panelist, uh, Nader Motuset from Amazon. Um, Nader, I'm going to go ahead and give you control of the, the presentation. Great. Okay, can everyone... Um... See my screen just fine? Yes. All right, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Nader Motazad, and I've been with Amazon for about four years now. I'm currently supporting the um, Amazon Global Selling Team. So I support sales teams that, that have account managers and account representatives that work with US based businesses to expand their business, digital business, to um, countries all over the world outside of the North, the North America. So with that, I'll go ahead and get into the overall opportunity that you have worldwide with um, by selling on Amazon. So as you can see, the numbers are, I mean, they're substantial. Uh, 300 million worldwide active customer accounts and a little bit more than half of those are prime uh, members. And we do offer prime um, eligibility worldwide as well in uh, mainly Europe and Australia. Um, and on top of that, excluding Amazon.com, we have over 700 million monthly unique visitors to all our other marketplaces worldwide. With that said, I'd like to get into our largest marketplace outside of .com, and that is um, 
Amazon Europe. And that consists of multiple countries that kind of together work um, within a system. And it makes it very easy for a US-based business to reach all the countries within the EU 26 uh, to really expand their business tenfold and leverage the Amazon's fulfilled by Amazon warehouses all around, um, strategically placed all around Europe. So our five main countries in Europe are Germany, UK, France, Italy, and Spain. And as you can see, Germany and UK comprise of the majority of our monthly unique visits. Um, the reason why most of you might think, oh, well, I'm surprised that Germany is more than the UK. However, the reason being is that in Austria, they speak German as well. So you have pretty much two countries visiting one site. And then obviously UK is very big on e-commerce and they have staggering numbers as well and followed with Amazon France, IT, and Spain. And also, we just recently, we've launched Amazon Netherlands. So that's our sixth uh, platform with its own domain where customers can now shop on. And it doesn't stop there. Basically, customers all around Europe go to these sites and they are able to, um, these, uh, you're able to export goods out of like, let's say the UK into any of the countries that are listed right here, um, over 28 of them. So, so let's say you have a customer in Sweden who's visiting an Amazon UK site, they will be able to put in an order as long as the product is not restricted and exportable, they'll be able to put in the order and you'll be able to fulfill that order to a country outside of the UK. Um, you might be asking, okay, well, how, how, does, how do you even begin to get started with this process? And it's actually fairly simple. Um, you know, for practicality's sake, if any of you are interested, just feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn and I can put you in touch with one of our account managers and they can help you in, in regard to um, expanding to Europe. Um, the easiest path is to first launch in the UK. And so in that sense, a, a US-based business will work with an Amazon account manager um, to obtain a value-added tax ID. And from there, once you obtain that value-added tax ID, you're actually allowed to ship your product to a UK warehouse, an Amazon UK warehouse, and store it there. And from there, um, you will actually be able to list your product on the UK site. And you're also, for no additional cost, you're able to list your product on the other five sites as well. And Amazon provides services to translate your product um, automatically as long as the product exists. So if, let's say you're a reseller, and you're selling a product that many other companies sell as well, most likely Amazon will be able to find that and we have uh, machine learning algorithms that will automatically translate your products at no additional cost. Now, if you're a brand owner, um, what you're going to do is um, the, an Amazon account manager can put you in touch with a third party partner that will be able to provide um, translation uh, services for highly discounted rates. And with that, I mean, you, you'll be on six different um, Amazon Europe websites. And at that point, you're in touch with 30 plus countries that can purchase your products. And it, it really does rival your customer base in the US. Um, next, we have Amazon Australia. So Australia is a much smaller marketplace. It's comparable to Canada. They're roughly around 30 million um, citizens in Australia but their, their growth rates are really promising and it's a, that's a very low friction kind of um, expansion at this point um, that you are not required to provide a, any sort of tax ID until you hit a certain revenue threshold. So it's much easier to actually get up and running within Australia. And also since they're an English speaking country, there's no uh, need for translations or anything like that. So, in terms of the actual time it takes to launch successfully in Australia, it's much shorter than Europe. Albeit, it's going to you're going to your customer outreach is going to be much less. But to kind of get your feet wet, Australia is not a bad option to get going. Um, and then one of our other largest uh, marketplaces is Japan. And they have almost 90 million monthly unique visitors. Uh, as you guys are aware, Japan's a very very digital economy and their customers are very accustomed to shopping online. So that's why they, they're pretty much, in terms of country, they come second to the US in terms of active users on uh, Amazon.Japan. Um, so as you can see, the majority of their shoppers make purchases online and 
it's a very young young kind of crowd and basically you will be able to reach out to many customers who are not as hesitant to purchase products online the friction points are a bit more stringent in japan compared to let's say australia but with the help of an account manager you really you have all the tools that are necessary to expand in a very streamlined and kind of intuitive manner and lastly, um, we have so many new marketplaces popping up. Uh, just this year, we've launched Amazon Singapore. Last year, we uh, launched Amazon Middle East and North Africa. And again, this year, we have launched Amazon Turkey. Uh, these are very new uh, marketplaces that are really, it's kind of the Wild West there. It's first come, first serve. If, if you get in the marketplace quickly, you can establish your brand's presence or your, you know, your company name's presence. and develop you know, additional market share and have less competition to kind of work with. Um, in the future, we're also going, I think we'll be launching in Brazil very shortly. It will be by the end of this quarter if it hasn't already been launched. Um, and typically when a marketplace first launches, the friction points are very minimal and low. And for example, Singapore is another um, prominently English speaking country. So there's no need for translations. In Singapore. Um, so that's another very low friction kind of pr pretty much all you'll need is either a passport or two forms of ID, which would include like a license, a driver's license and um, birth certificate. And you, you can pretty much start listing right as you go um, and get gain access to customers worldwide. And with my final point, um, Prime Day isn't exclusive to the United States. They, it is being utilized all across the globe in terms of Amazon promotional um, events. And as you can see, I mean, our prime day sales for third party sellers surpassed Amazon's retail business. It's become a huge opportunity for brands and resellers to kind of force multiply their, their sales, uh, develop their brand recognition and really launch their uh, notoriety worldwide. And outside of Prime Day, of course, you have all sorts of local, um, you know, holidays that run their own separate promotions that obviously once you're launching those marketplaces, you'll have Amazon communicating with you and making sure that you are set up to uh, provide the best deals and really optimize the, um, the promotional event at that time and maximize your sales at that moment. And that is, that is all. So with any questions you guys might have, I'd be happy to um, answer them as you go. Thank you, Nader. Um, I, th there are a couple of questions for you, and I think one of them is a, is a follow-up to, uh, you did touch on uh, VAT in Europe. Um, so the question is, how does Amazon take care of duties and taxes, uh, VAT between different countries in Europe? And then the other question, sort of a follow-up to that is, what is the minimum number of units we have to ship to an Amazon warehouse? Got it. So um, when it comes to duties and taxes, we have our account manager will help you with that, but we have uh, third party partners that will can take care of everything for you. Um, there's there's a program with Amazon seller central site called the preferred partner network. And so you, you'll have a plethora of um, third party partners that you can work with. And they really, they, they are experts and they will be able to handle all sorts of compliance issues. Um, they will be able to forecast your duties that you're going to pay um, and also any sort of um, expert customs entry fees and things like that. So all that is, will be taken care of. And then Amazon also has, once you are, let's say once you do get your product in the country, Amazon provides kind of tax services where they will um, itemize your unit sales and put in the line um, of the tax line right below. And you, by the end of each quarter, when it comes to file, you already have everything kind of organized and ready to sum up and um, submit to the Department of Revenue or whatnot for each of those countries. Um, so everything is really sorted out. It has made it very easy for businesses to manage. I, I, I know multiple businesses that have launched nearly all of the market, global marketplaces we have, and they have mentioned how hands-off they can be and how, how, how many things are actually automated within Amazon and also through their third-party um, providers that we have referred them to. And um, I believe your second, could you uh, repeat your second question? Yeah, uh, the, the question was about the, the volume uh, that a company has to 
into a warehouse? Like, is there yes, a so that's a great question because a lot of uh, businesses they don't want to go all in and send you know thousands of units and then realize oh it's not moving as slow and you have too many weeks to cover and that's you have inventory costs associated with that. So there's a couple ways you can go about it. A lot of um, businesses might start with a small batch of maybe 100 units just to test it. Obviously, their unit cost for uh, their unit cost is higher when it comes to shipping, but it's kind of a lower risk in, in terms of you know, you're, you're, self, you're sending less over, so you, you're not at risk of having too too many items isolated. Another option is a feature within Amazon.com. It's called FBA Export, and FBA stands for Fulfilled by Amazon, just to clarify. But um, FBA Export is a feature where you can remain an Amazon seller in the US and just enable this feature. Amazon automatically checks to see the number of listings that you have that are eligible to be exported to other countries. Um, you guys might not be aware, but a lot of external customers, so customers outside of the US, come to Amazon.com and shop. And if you have this feature enabled and they see your catalog, if let's say I'm a customer in China and I'm looking at your catalog, any item that you have that's eligible to be shipped to China, they will be able to purchase that. And once you have that feature enabled, you can um, pull a report that will show you all your FBA export sales. And that will help you kind of forecast and analyze, okay, if I'm generating, let's say hundred units a month to the UK through this FBA export program, I could expect that to be maybe 5x. On average, we'd expect it to be 3 to 5x in terms of demand once you've localized your product over there. Um, so that's another really good way of doing it without any sort of additional cost. Um, and that's, uh, that's another thing. There's no additional cost to you. The additional shipping cost go is um, put on to the customer. And they knowingly pay more just to be able to pr uh, purchase your product. Wow, thank you. That's, uh, I think this is a perfect segue for our next panelist, uh, Dr. Baxter, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer from Pain Care Labs, and actually a, a user, a very active user of uh, Amazon's platform. So mm -hmm. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Baxter. Thank you. I hope that my internet will stick with me for 10 minutes. I mm -hmm. uh, take into my time. All right. I also, I feel a little bit like at the beginning of the Oscars, where I've got to really quickly thank everyone. So first of all, I want to thank Michael Tyson Jones for giving a shout out to the hate crimes bill because we've signed it individually. I didn't know we could sign it as a company and that's a really important thing. The ecosystem in Atlanta has made it possible for us to do our business. And I think it started with the export challenge which enabled us to go to Medica. Rick Martin's um, SBDC program, the Export Georgia, we met George Tracy there, learned a lot. And then we have, gosh, worked with everybody from Carrie Barnett. We've gone on programs to multiple international locations. All of these things wouldn't be possible. And then just the, the ecosystem. So the Charles Shapiro's World Affair Council, by being a member there, we've been able to meet so many people in the consular corps that have then given us legs up when we go to other countries. So um, thank all of you for this opportunity. And now after my thank yous, I'm going to show my screen and uh, let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. So our company is Pain Care Labs and we make multiple different reusable devices that use a platform. I'd like to go on Shark Tank and at some point in my career as a pediatric emergency doctor, one of my colleagues used the device to not take opioids after surgery, which really changed the tenor and the focus of our orientation. So now we are looking at multiple platforms to block pain. So our progress has grown, um, particularly last year, 64% growth, and much of that is due to our online presence. Before COVID, we'd estimated that we were gonna have about 5 million in sales, and that was going to be largely from our international and Amazon growth. So the things that we have learned, um, particularly a lot of stuff that George helped us with, was getting our internet platform to be digital ready. So one of the things with our website, which was simple, was just the concept of adding international to our menu and adding a phone number that indicated that we realized that America was not the only area code and way to talk to people. We also were able to integrate international shipping in our website. We use Shopify and um, 
and it just loading the rates in the carts, um, making and generating automatically commercial invoices so that we can send our products to countries automatically without having to get involved, loading the system with harmonized codes for customs, and then the suggestion to just highlight our international partners. We're in 27 countries, but particularly a lot of the countries where there are Amazon locations, because we're a medical device, it's an extra level before we can get to the place where um, we can immediately go on Amazon. So featuring our international partners has been something that has helped our international sales. The outcomes from using all of this advice and leveraging these relationships so this year we've had a 25% increase in our web traffic outside the US and um, the particular places where we are seeing uh, uptick is in India, Canada, and the UK. You know, one thing that I'd like to, uh, to focus on a little is that the resources that we get from the US commercial services and the trade experts are when we have someone in India who wants to be our commercial partner and says that they can get us into all the different jurisdictions, we actually have been able to use the resources with the commercial trade service to evaluate that partner, look and see whether or not their credit rating is good. And we've leveraged that for everything from trade services to patent protection to finding companies that can help us patent in China. So. Um, India in particular is a hot spot now, and because of the services that we've gotten through our connections in Atlanta, it's made it easier. So um, the we are we are visited every year by over a hundred countries, and the top translations, interestingly, are are Dutch and Portuguese. And over the past year, our top purchases online without us doing anything have been from um, France and uh, Japan. So moving a little bit just to talk about Amazon and our, our platform, uh, right now about a third of our sales are US Amazon sales. And we took a dip in April, but the sales this month are probably gonna come back to where they normally are. We are automatically, we found with this uh, program that Nader alluded to, we're selling products to Australia. So that was an interesting thing because we have a distributor there. They have not broached the Amazon platform there but we're already shipping some things and it's already listed. So that was uh, partially, I suppose, because Australia has a lower barrier of entry. And we currently have a consultant that's helping us optimize our Amazon listings. We don't have specific competition because we have a unique product, but enabling people to find something that doesn't exist is a challenge. So using our partner, they have actually offered to help take the lessons learned on Amazon and apply them specifically in Germany, the UK, and Australia. So we're working with that now. So I just, again, want to say thank you for everything with the Metro Chamber. One of the biggest things is we've been able to go to Medica. And so that first export challenge grant of $5,000 paid for the, the travel to Medica, uh, the value and the 20-fold orders that we got from that investment led us to decide to go to Chemis, where we're now working with Korean groups and we're trying to get our KFDA established with some of the partners we met there. And I would be remiss if I did not give the biggest shout out to Jennifer Tipping, who is the international director of our team. And uh, this is Ms. Tipping on a camel that she got to go through because she went to Arab Health. So the, the benefits of doing international business from Atlanta are legion. So I, I uh, will just close up with the fact that, that the trajectory we have and the traction that we have gotten are continue to increase. And I would love to take any questions or talk about some of the lessons we've learned. Thank you, Amy. Um, I would just want to mention real quick that we might run five minutes over. So um, I hope you all stick with us. And for you, Amy, um, so I've I'm very excited to always hear about your success in the international market. Um, so last year I had the, the, um, the pleasure to really visit your booth at the Medica conference in, in Germany. And on the way over there, I was even able to read about your company in the Sky Magazine on the Delta flight. So that was very exciting. And so it's really a good sign of how serious you take this whole international business. And that really leads me to uh, one question I have for you. So exporting in 
in general requires leadership and staff committed to exporting. And this doesn't change for, for, um, for selling in a digital market space. What are key roles within your company that must be filled to be successful? For example, how do you handle customer complaints, those kind of things? Right. So there are three roles that are critical. Uh, the first thing is the role that Jennifer Tipping holds, which is really being an ambassador. There is no substitute for the personal relationships. And so we have been fortunate in that both of us travel a lot. So we're able to meet people in person and to reinforce those. We'll see what happens over the next two years. Um, but it, fortunately, we've had really good relations even with a new check distributor and some check companies through bio which was another opportunity that we got through the metro chamber so um so the the personal relationships um so jennifer tipping handles those we also the regulatory is critical so valerie staffy handles the management of what our fda requirements are and then together jennifer and val work really as an integrated team. So for example, right now in getting our KFDA approval, we have to have MSDS certifications for all of our biocompatibility and testing for our devices. So Val gets those copies, gets them in a, a, in a, in a format that Jennifer can then give them to our partners in Korea so that we can get that established. And, and none of that would have happened if we hadn't gone through the US Commercial Services Department to verify that the partners in Korea were worth the effort, the trouble, and the money to get that done. So the, the, our three-legged stool is, uh, is Jennifer Chipping, Valerie Staffy, and then I just get to go on camera and tell people about it when I'm actually not doing any of the heavy lifting internationally. Thank you so much. Um, I would have many more questions, but I want to move on and I want to hand it over to George. Um, so besides being a great musician, George is also the director for the US Export Assistance Center. So I want to give him the, ch uh, the chance to talk about cross-border digital strategies. Thank you, George. Yeah, no, thanks for the intro and thanks for all the kudos, Dr. Baxter, appreciate it. Um, well, so yeah, my organization, U.S. Commercial Service, we're actually part of the International Trade Administration, which rolls up to the Department of Commerce, which is a federal organization. Um, we're a little unusual in that, uh, you know, we're a pretty useful government organization. Our mission is to help create U.S. jobs, and we do that by uh, helping companies export. We typically work with small, mid-sized companies. We do work with the really big companies on occasion, but we have a network of trade specialists, export, experts in exporting across the country, uh, at least one in every state. Most states have more than one. And then we have a, a network of foreign commercial officers who all work out of the embassies and the consulates worldwide to help American companies penetrate those specific target markets. So really useful organization. Definitely reach out to us. We can help you. Specific to the internet, one thing to clarify, at least from, the perspective, from our perspective, is that the, the digital economy, which is what we call it, has a number of different facets. One is e-commerce. Now to us, e-commerce is actually transacting through the internet without the intervention of any kind of human being, right? You also have m-commerce nowadays, that's mobile commerce. You have s-commerce, which is leveraging social media and selling things through social media. Then of course, you have the, um, the online brochure sales and marketing side of a website, which all companies have. And, uh, and that's an area where we can really help you guys out. Um, when it comes to cross-border e-commerce, and again, e-commerce being transacting through the internet without intervention of a human being, we typically discourage our clients from trying to do that cross-border just because there's a, there's a misunderstanding that when you sell something through the internet, maybe certain regulations and laws and labeling requirements and all the things that you'd need to do in order to sell into that target country don't apply. We've had a lot of our clients get in big trouble selling things before they were actually ready. So what our recommendation really is, is for clients to um, find partners in these countries to, well, A, help them penetrate those countries in a serious way. You know, we're, we're not really here to try to sell one or two products. We're trying to help our clients sell hundreds or thousands of products or services, right? So we encourage them to find partners in these countries and then formulate a digital strategy in country with that partner. And that digital strategy would include leveraging marketplaces like Amazon, which is just uh, what Matter was talking about, can't 
encourage you enough to look into that outstanding option uh, to leverage. Um, but but for us, since we're trying to get companies to make exporting part of their strategic plan and make it a big part of their business, so they hire people, uh, we typically say, hey, look, let us help you find partners in these in these countries. Then with that country form uh, with that partner, formulate your digital strategy and take advantage of all the digital options within that marketplace. And maybe e-commerce, m-commerce, s-commerce, um, all that may become part of it. Um, one of the specific services that we offer and that we've actually done for um, pain care, uh, Dr. Baxter's company, is called Website Globalization Review. And what we do is we take a look at your website and we give you specific recommendations around uh, things that you can do to optimize your site, to be more appealing to international visitors and hopefully retain them so that they reach out and contact you. Um, specifically for our purposes, since ultimately we're gonna to try to encourage your company to go overseas and find these partners, it's really important because obviously the first thing somebody overseas is gonna do if they're thinking about doing business with your company is go to your website. So these recommendations that we make give you uh, an awful lot of great, we think great information and very inexpensive, easy things to change that will uh, greatly facilitate your ability to attract and retain international visitors. So, I, you know, summing up, because I imagine there's going to be some questions and whatnot. Um, from a strategic and tactical perspective, like I said, we'd be very cautious around attempting cross-border e-commerce before you operationalize for exporting. It's not that it's a bad idea, but our organization and all of our partners, uh, we offer a lot of these free services that can help your company operationalize for exporting. So just trying to sell things on the internet without interacting with the buyer in all these foreign countries can be really risky. So be incredibly cautious about that. But definitely take advantage of us. I mean, I keep saying we're free. We're not free, you pay taxes. So um, use your tax dollars, contact us, and we can do a lot of different things for you, including help you globalize your website and make more internet sales. And with that, I'll, um, I'll wrap up and answer some questions. Thank you, George. Cesar, mm -hmm. do we have any questions from the audience for George directly? Yeah, I'm going through the questions right now. If you want to go ahead and uh, I know you have a couple follow-up questions for George. Yeah. If you want to take those and then I'll, I'll come back. Absolutely. So George, for you, um, one question that we had was, can selling through the internet replace the need for an in-country partner? So the general answer to that, I'd say is, it well, it depends. There's certain, not all things apply to all companies, right? But in general, we would say no, um, simply because of the risks and whatnot that I mentioned. Now, you know, there's caveats to that. Natter was mentioning, uh, leveraging the Amazon platform to figure out which countries might be good to target, that's a great idea, right? Because sometimes our clients aren't exactly sure where they wanna go, or maybe they have some anecdotal evidence that certain markets might be good. It's a fantastic idea to try it out, use the Amazon service and give that a try. And in that, in that scenario though, Amazon is fundamentally becoming that, that partner, right? And then if that market works out, they may wanna go in there in a much bigger way, find a, a, a real business partner for thousands of units going in, et cetera. Um, but in general, we would always encourage companies to, uh, well, let's just say, make sure they do their homework, thorough homework, before attempting to sell through the internet to people in a foreign country without fully understanding what is really required to do that. Okay, Cesar. Um, hey, George, um, a question came, came in from the audience. So um, one is, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, and two, uh, if they are interested in the services that, that you provide, how do they go about making an appointment? Yeah, well, to get in touch with me, um, you know, Dr. Baxter mentioned this and, and Michael and I think Cesar, you did too. It, it's true. In Georgia, we're super lucky. We've got just tons of out, outstanding organizations that provide all sorts of free services to, to exporters. So you can reach out to any of us. Um, I think Cesar, Michael, are you going to send out contact information or can you send out? Yes, I will. Yeah. Okay, so you'll get the contact information for, for me. Um, and uh, as far as engaging us, our services, we actually have a methodology that we use. It's very effective called the International Expansion Blueprint. 
Um, it's, a, it's a best practice methodology designed to help companies uh, operationalize for exporting and then hopefully um, ultimately end up helping you find partners in the target countries that are all, uh, you know, we determine are, are good prospects for your company. Sounds good. Um, I think we have a question, question that came in. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, you know, my another question that came in from the audience is: um, Have you seen a diminished demand for perishable products in the midst of COVID? That's a question for George. For me. Anybody? If anybody has. We really haven't. Um, well. Let me step back. We've seen a diminished demand for everything that wasn't isn't medical <laughs> related, like um, like masks and hand sanitizer and all of that. Uh, to, but it but it seems like things are coming back online pretty quickly right now. Um, and uh, you, you know we have whole teams that focus on uh, perishable goods, and yeah, they, they're seeing they're seeing things rapidly returning to normal, just like most of the other industry sectors. Um, yeah, I just I saw that, like Amy, you have a we have a question. I've got a question for Nader. Um, so we didn't realize that we were on Australian Amazon, and the product is actually our our knee pain device, which is getting an uptick because people can't go to the, get their knee replacement, so they've got to use something for pain. But we didn't know we were on that. Um, did you just automatically set up everybody in Australia because the the threshold is low, or do we have a setting someplace? And um, how do we find out what countries we're selling in through Amazon, through FBA, that we may not have known? Um, so, do you mean like your products actually physically being stored in Australia, or is it being shipped to Australia for order? That they're, they're, um, we're not shipping, we're not doing FBA or shipping to Australia. They are coming from our Amazon shipments that we send to all the various US centers. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are fulfilling to orders from Australia, but okay, we're listed on Australia Amazon. But you are actually listed on the Australian side. Interesting. Okay. Um, that one wouldn't be automatic. You would have to actually create an account and actually list your products on the Australian site. So I'm wondering if your uh, consultant went ahead and did that. Um, so, I mean, you and I can connect afterwards and I can kind of, you can swap me or give me a link to one of your products on the Australian site. Um, but if the product is being out of the U.S. warehouse, and that would be through the FBA export program, which I, which I talked about briefly earlier. Um, basically, that would be an Australian customer coming to .com and seeing your product and then or paying the extra amount of shipping to order that. And obviously, they wouldn't be eligible for like Prime and get it in two days. It would probably be a two or four week lead time instead. But yeah, I'm curious to see if your, uh, <laughs> your consultant actually really went through the process of launching you in Australia and if your product is out there. Um, and if it is, then it might, if you have demand, there might be a good idea to do FBA in Australia to reduce shipping costs. Yeah, our, our Australian distributor was surprised to see it there as well. So we'll get in touch. <laughs> So before I, I hand it over to Cesar to close the meeting, um, I would like to each of you of the panelists to give one tangible suggestion for companies that want to engage in e-commerce and want to use digital platforms to sell their products. Um, just like a minute each to just give your suggestion, your first step or your most important step. Maybe let's start with in the order of the speakers, uh, Dr. Doria. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, my one, one second suggestion is work with our students. We are working very hard in our college and in our university to prepare them for the digital economy, to become the next business leaders. Work with our students and, and I think you will win. I guess my recommendation would be kind of alluding to what George had mentioned is do your homework, do a lot of research. There's so much information on the internet. I mean, there's status, uh, even on .com, Amazon.com, you can see what products are really popular. Really try to make a strategic decision on which country you export to first. You wanna make sure that your product has the demand there to make it and bring the economies of scale and make it feasible for your company to 
um, turn a profit and not hemorrhage, you know, cash flow or anything like that. I think it's very important to be data driven in this day and age and to really make a strategic decision in your expansion globally. Ooh, I'm next. Um, so I would say be very data driven. So using the analytics to know who is looking at your website, to know what kind of demand and volume and Math from there because you look and see what the per capita income is. I mean, for us, we've got medical products. So, um, so just be data driven. Use those analytics and use the knowledge of the per capita income and the the for us what kind of healthcare system they have. Are they used to paying for their own healthcare products or not? And then put that together as a strategy. Yeah, and for me, well, first of all, if you're not exporting, you should definitely look into it. Um, you know, I think a lot of our clients that have never looked into exporting, once they start talking to us, they realize that you can do it. It's, uh, it's, it, there's things you have to put in, in place and whatnot. The resources are out there to help you. So definitely do it. But specific to the web, um, you know, I don't think we need to convince anybody that the internet's important in business right now. So, you know. Uh, do things around globalizing your website, making your website more appealing to international buyers um, for all sorts of reasons. For one, it's great market intelligence to start getting a lot of inquiries from, from a particular country. It's probably because they want your stuff. Uh, but also just because the, you know most of the world's purchasing power, 95% of it's outside the US. So if you aren't uh, aggressively pursuing overseas opportunities, you're missing out. So. Uh, it, the, we have a, a resource that we've developed called Export U. It's www.export-u.com, and maybe Cesar can send that out. But uh, there's a bunch of webinars on there. One of them is specific to website globalization. And if you watch it, uh, there's recommendations in there that are virtually cost-free or completely free that uh, you don't need to be a super technical person to make. And uh, make those changes because it will make a big difference for you. Thank you. Cesar? Thank you, George. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to thank all our panelists. Thank you for joining us and thank you for, for your time. Um, I also want to uh, thank our attendees for participating today. And I do apologize. I know we went over a few minutes, uh, but just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, you know, We will share the recording of today's webinar. Uh, we will also share everybody's contact information. Um, I know that there was a couple of questions that we didn't get to. So I will share those questions with uh, each individual and put you in touch with them. Um, I know there was a couple of links and studies that were mentioned throughout the conversation. We'll get those links for you. We'll share those with you as well. Um, as George mentioned, uh, please do reach out to us. I mean, we are here to support you. We're here to help you. We wanna make sure that you are successful in what you're doing. So see all of us as resources uh, and a resource that you're already paying for. Uh, so please do reach out to us. And lastly, I just wanna uh, point out that uh, on on April, wait, did I just lose my? Uh, we have a, another webinar coming up on July 9th, actually as a follow up to um, Nader's presentation on Amazon, really kind of taking a, a deeper dive into how to do business on Amazon. So this will be on July 9th um, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Be on the lookout for an email and invitation. With that being said, uh, again, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Go out there, export, make some business. Let's make some things happen. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.